What's in a name? In the past, when Christians talked about Jesus, it was safe to assume we were talking about the Son of God become man who conquered death to save the lost. You know, the person the Bible's about. But with the rise of liberal theology in the 19th and 20th centuries, that meaning began to change. At least for some people. Christ, liberal theologians said, might be better understood as an idea, a metaphor, or even a good example rather than the sinless, supernatural Savior who accomplished our redemption in the first century. This was J. Gresham Machen's line in the sand in 1923. If we don't worship the same Christ, Machen said, we don't have the same religion. Politics, technology, identity, power, science, everything seems to be changing. So why not faith? This is Christianity and Liberalism, a podcast based on the book by J. Gresham Machen. In this show, we'll be discussing a modern-day church in crisis and engaging with Machen's classic text to see what lessons we can learn and apply 100 years later. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand We bring the antithesis, the lamb's dripping wrist Is still the only answer for man's wickedness The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL, with Machen we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell It should go without saying that a basic tenet of Christianity is that Jesus Christ was real, a historic person who did what the Bible says he did. But in the 19th century, some intellectuals began to popularize a quest for the historical Jesus, basically a creative retelling of Christ's life in which the Bible was not an authoritative source. Although the academic attempt to authoritatively rewrite the life of Jesus was unsuccessful, the spirit of unbelief within the church that Machen addressed in Christianity and Liberalism is very much alive and well today. Outside of conservative biblical Christianity, it's not uncommon to find all kinds of ideas about who or what Christ is. So how is the Christian to know? We'll talk about that and more with my guest today. Dr. Thomas Keene is Associate Professor of New Testament and Academic Dean at Reform Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., and he has served as a pastor for several years in the Presbyterian Church in America. I began our conversation by asking Tommy when he first discovered Christianity and liberalism for himself. Yeah, I I actually came across Christianity and liberalism in, in a sort of a, a strange way. Uh, in, in high school, I discovered this uh, weird fact that people write books about Christianity. Uh, it, I had no, no idea that you could write a book about, you know, theology. Uh, I thought that was just opinions and uh, opinions of pastors and, and people out there. So when I discovered this, I, I dove in uh, as, as the nerd that I am and just started reading anything I could, I could come by. And there was this little, uh, used bookstore and Christianity and liberalism was in the religion section. So I picked it up not knowing that it was, uh, not knowing that I would eventually end up at Westminster, um, and really just enjoyed it, uh, as a con- consumer of theology in, in high school, uh, I think it didn't, for for me, liberalism wasn't like this present danger. I mean, I was at a conservative PCA church in the South of all places. So uh, liberalism wasn't kind of like encroaching in on my life, but I think it did serve as kind of a a vaccine for, uh, for later, you know, going through college and studying philosophy, studying religion in uh, in my college years, and then I think Machen, Van Til, and some others that I'd read in high school were really helpful in 
applying that kind of critical mindset to the things that I was learning. Hmm. So you grew up in a reformed context in the PCA yep. in the South. PCA and, in the South. And where did you go to undergrad? Did you was it a secular university or Christian university? Did you say? Uh, it was Furman University, South Carolina. Uh, so it, it uh, used to be very Baptist. It still has very Baptist uh, kind of student body, but it's not affiliated. Right. So you weren't confronted with liberalism in that particular context, but it sort of helped. Oh, absolutely was. I mean, all okay. my all my all my faculty, all the professors were uh, liberal Christian humanists wow. uh, or or atheists. So it was not it was not a safe place to be a conservative Christian from an intellectual standpoint. Right. Did you find yourself engaging in that Christianity and liberalism debate? within the classroom or maybe even outside did, of those students? I did. And I think not always helpfully. I think mm -hmm. now looking back on it, you know, I had a, there was an edge that didn't need to be there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think if you're, there's a difference in attitude that comes when you're trying to persuade your professor to become a Christian versus trying to honor Christ in conversation with your professor. Th those are two different different goals. Um, and I think I had a very sort of argue people into heaven yeah. attitude uh, at that time that uh, th that through Furman and through seeing my professors behave honorably and treat me well and, and be kind and hmm. be ethical and all of these kinds of things, uh, you know, I, that softened a bit. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, because a book like this can influence you in a few ways. Right? Yeah. It can influence your thinking to think critically and to be uh, intellectually argumentative, uh, or it can really shape your your thinking about God in a way that that kind of communicates itself in a more humble attitude or um, being more winsome or a sort of great combination of the two, which you would hope. Yeah. And that, actually, that's one of the things I love about not only the tone of the book, but the the overall argument of Christianity and liberalism is that these are two different religions. Mm -hmm. he, he's it's the the point is not actually to directly address why everybody's wrong about every little point, but it, it has that more methodological approach of whatever we're doing, let's be honest about what we're doing. We're starting from two different starting points. We're starting with two different presuppositions about who Christ is and what his word means. And let's begin the conversation there rather than, you know, debating particular points. And I, I appreciated that sort of backdoor approach, that indirect approach to the truth of Christianity. It's that dilemma of how to confront falsehood that led noted Reformed theologian John Frame to write a controversial 2003 article called Machen's Warrior Children, in which he characterized Machen's followers as combative and prone to infighting. I asked Tommy if that matched up with his experience. Having talked a little bit of my journey, kind of from an argument first perspective to a more conversation first uh, perspective, I, I, I think I resonate with the question. And part, part of it, I think, is remembering um, Machen's context. I, again, this is sort of the, uh, you, you need a historian here, not a t New Testament guy, but this is sort of the, the tone of the, of the book and the indirect approach that the book takes is, is to some degree a part of this context of, you know, the liberals in Machen's day not playing fair using some of those Christian words, but using them in a way that wasn't um, adopting this language, the language of historic Christianity, but utilizing it to communicate something that was antithetical to it. And part of Machen's very direct tone throughout the book is really addressing that, that difference, that the integrity question. We need to be having this conversation uh, with the integrity of uh, being honest about where where we are and the truths on which we stand and their relationship to historic Christianity. So I think there's there, there's definitely a polemical uh, aspect to this. And I there's uh, po 
being polemical in certain contexts is is necessary when the truth is under attack. We are to stand to stand firm. Uh, but the the other component of this is, you know, I think about particularly the New Testament books that address heresy, that address false teaching. They're they're usually focused on actions, behaviors, uh, and they're usually encouraging Christians to continue faithfully on the path of love. And that's something I think in in a polemical age we've got to keep in mind is that part of this testimony that we're called to protect and fight for as the church militant is is the testimony of Jesus Christ who came because he loved the world and and came to seek the, the lost sheep and protecting that tone is an important aspect of our witness. In chapter six of Christianity and Liberalism, Machen explores the critical distinction between liberal claims about Christ and what the church has confessed for centuries. Here's Machen. What then is the difference between liberalism and Christianity with regard to the person of our Lord? The answer might be difficult to set forth in detail, but the essential thing can be put almost in a word. Liberalism regards Jesus as the fairest flower of humanity. Christianity regards him as a supernatural person. To some, that might seem like an insignificant difference of opinion. But as Machen shows, it is critical to the survival of our faith. So in this chapter, chapter six on Christ, this is Mm -hmm. one of the longer chapters in Christianity and liberalism. And Machen really addresses four issues, the person of Jesus, the meaning of sin, the reason for miracles, and the nature of God. So let's start where Machen starts, with the person of Jesus. When it comes to the person of Jesus, Machen draws a line in the sand between, at first, what might seem like a really nuanced distinction. Liberals, Machen says, sees Jesus as an example for faith rather than the object of faith, an example to be imitated rather than a gift to be received. Why is this such a critical distinction for the Christian faith? It, 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 this is at the heart of Machen's overall argument in the book, uh, but also particularly in this chapter, is that we're approaching religion in two very fundamentally different ways. Uh, the unique thing about Christianity, and it's not just Christianity against the liberals, and it's not just Christ- Christianity against some sort of false version of Christianity. It's Christianity among the gods, Christianity among all religions. The unique thing that we have is that, that we believe that God is intruding into space and time, that he cares about history, that he has brought forth his son in the fullness of time to bring about a redemptive act, that that history matters. Christianity isn't an idea or a path or a pursuit an ethos, Christianity is centrally about an event. It's about the son who came to bring many sons to glory. And without that event, there is no redemption. There is no path to walk. There is no idea that will bring us enlightenment. It's particularly this person and this time and this moment that matter. And that's that's a dangerous claim. To to say that your religion is grounded and based in a person and an event, not an idea, not a logic, not a path to walk, is is a dangerous claim because it's it's imminently falsifiable. If these things didn't happen, then our religion is meaningless. Uh, And so the, the liberal mode of thinking about Christ, realizing that this is risky, is to realizing that attaching your redemption to a moment in time, which may or may not have happened. I mean, I think it did happen, but you know, something that's contingent. Did he rise from the dead or not? That's a dangerous claim. And so there's this move to somehow detach the truth of Christianity from its historical 
moment. It's historical, uh, the, the need of the moment, the resurrection of Christ. And Machen is going with that distinction between following the faith of Christ. Christianity is a way of life that Christ pioneered versus believing in Christ. Christianity as an event in which you can participate by the resurrection of the dead is, is key to his overall argument. Those are two different modes of religion. The one is trusting in a path and the other is trusting in a person. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And one is certainly man-centered. The other one is God-centered. Right. And it seems right. like such a natural, sinful response to look to Jesus and say, Yes, he is the fairest flower of humanity, as Machen puts it. Mm -hmm. And I ought to follow in his footsteps, slap on my bracelet, what would Jesus do? Pull up my 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 bootstraps, my moral bootstraps, and get to work, white knuckling it. You know, this is this is the the path of man. And it certainly is a natural human response, sinful one, to achieve one's own or establish one's own righteousness before God. But yeah. But he turns that and he says, we can't look to the Bible as some mere ethical guide, as so many have done so since the Enlightenment and even before then. We need to look to him as an object of faith. Right. So as an object of faith, then, uh, if we look to him and his redeeming work, as Machen encourages us to do so, uh, what does that mean about being an example? Does, does Machen or the New Testament forbid us from looking to Christ as an example? Yeah, ab absolutely not. And there's this wonderful quote. It's not it's not his focus in this chapter, but there's this wonderful quote at the beginning, where where Machen says Jesus is not for Paul. This is uh, page eighty one of my copy. Jesus was not for Paul merely an example for faith. He was primarily the object of faith. The religion of Paul did not consist in having faith in God like the faith which Jesus had in God. It consisted rather in having faith in Jesus. And then he goes on. To, to qualify this, to put a footnote on it, the example of Jesus was found by Paul, moreover, not merely in the acts of incarnation and atonement, but even in the daily life of Jesus in Palestine. And I love that quote because it perfectly captures the difference between liberalism and Christianity, as Machen sees it, but it also deepens actually what we, a, a truly Christian view of what following Jesus' example means. So first, it distinguishes between liberalism and Christianity. Ob Christ is the object of faith, not the merely the example of faith. But Machen doesn't just throw out the idea of Jesus as an example. It's precisely in his unique work as son that Jesus then becomes a, an example for us as the many sons who follow him unto glory. He, he is the the one to imitate his path and I, and what Machen does here in this subtle way is say it's even in the incarnation and atoning work and resurrection of Christ that we become imitators of him well how how do I become an imitator of Jesus in his incarnation uh, you know what does that even mean for me who is not you know a divine being from before the foundations of the earth. Well, it's right there in Paul, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. He, we are to have this mind in ourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself, didn't count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, our man-centeredness. We're to repent of that, humble ourselves, humble ourselves even to death, because why? Because our Savior did that. And this is, this is I think, when a truly Christian framework of thinking about the person and the work of Christ and mapping that onto Christ as an example, it actually goes deeper than the liberals ever could. It's, it's grounded, not in, again, this sort of like ethical path in abstract. It's grounded in the unique work of Christ as God's son, as the son sent and raised and enthroned in heaven. We become imitators of all of those things which the liberal ideology has has denied. And so I am actually, hopefully, it doesn't always work out this way in practical life, but hopefully as a believer who, who embraces the fact that Jesus died a kind of death that I will never die, I become a kind of second order image or imitator of him in every aspect of my life. 
and I and I believe in the resurrection of the dead. So I believe that I can face every kind of suffering for the joy set before me because I've already seen the way in which that works out, the glory that is to come. And as I share in his sufferings, I share when his glory will be revealed. Hmm. So there's there's this powerful actually ground for Jesus's example, the Amatio Christi. Mm-hmm. A more powerful ground if we maintain his unique work as the atoning son. That's right. And that's why I really love when Machen says, the imitation of Jesus has a fundamental place in, in the Christian life. Yeah, It is perfectly correct to represent him as our supreme and only perfect example. It just wasn't the most important thing. According to Machen, it was swallowed up by something far more important still. Yeah. Not the example of Jesus, but the redeeming work of Jesus, or the redeeming work of the Son, as you put it, was the primary thing in the New Testament. The Imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ, is such an important concept for Machen in this chapter. In it, he combats a liberal tendency to see Christ as a mere example, which is an old inclination. Medieval Roman Catholicism also looked to Christ as an example to imitate, which Martin Luther confronted. In his brilliant tract, titled What to Look for and Expect in the Gospels, Luther argued that we must first receive Christ as a gift before we look to him as an example. Christ is not outside of us as some external standard to reach, leaving us to ourselves. Rather, he's in us, conforming us to his likeness from the inside out. Well, and I think for Machen, that that idea of swallowed up, you know, it for Machen, the ethics is mm. grounded in the person. Yes. It, it, and it can't be detached from the redemptive historical work of God mm-hmm. through his son for his for his sons, the Adamic sons. This is the son of man idea. Uh, it, it is grounded in who Jesus is as God's eternal son, as God's Adamic son, his true divinity, his true humanity that grounds Christian ethics. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't, I don't think he does this in this chapter, uh, but he could continue the logic and say, actually, the ethics of liberalism, insofar as it's grounded in humanism, in hu- you know, human decency, whatever that might be, rather than Christ and Christ who believed in a faithful creator while doing good insofar as it's grounded in humanism rather than Christ, it, it doesn't have ethical depth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's not grounded in eschatology. Just get, you're getting me excited because there is one line where he says religion and ethics are inseparable in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, to go back to what you're saying, there's so many people, I mean, whether it's your average Christian or scholars today who talk about the imitation of Christ as something distinct from participation in Christ, right? As if he is this example who's out there, far off, a standard that's perfect that I need to follow. Machen says, go ahead and try. You're not going to do it. And in fact, if he only presented himself as this example for you, then he's the most unworthy example because he claimed to be far more than that. He claimed to be the son of God who came to redeem you. And so we participate in his work, in his person, and thereby receive the strength that is necessary yeah. for us to yeah. be like him. Yeah, and going back to our previous discussion, um, it's so crucial for the church to fight for this, for the idea of a, of atonement, of the unique work, work of Christ. Of, Machen goes on to talk about his eternal, his eternal sonship, his Adamic sonship. Like these are things on which Christianity stands or falls. As Paul puts it, if there is no resurrection from the dead, we are still in our sins, and you are worse off than the unbeliever. You know, if so if these things aren't true, then Christianity itself is a false religion. But if they are true, then this is, in fact, our hope. And having said that, and I think the church should fight for these things, these 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 truths about who Christ is and what has happened, uh, what He has done and what has happened to Him. But we, ha- but part and parcel of that is following His lead. Uh, he is He is the Lord. He is the Savior. We are not, and therefore we should engage this conversation with humility, 
the humility of, of, of a servant seeking to, to please our master. Uh, so, so, so we do this while imitating Christ, not instead of imitating Christ. As Machen points out, when speaking about Christ, liberal theologians often use the same words the church has always used, words like incarnation and resurrection, but they mean something entirely different by them. I asked Tommy why that matters and how we can be discerning. Uh, for a, a kind of classic liberal theologian, I- incarnation is at best an idea. It's, a, it's an image, uh, a metaphor for humility. And as, as a metaphor, it has some usefulness. It has some work to do. But it does because it's not grounded in a historical event. It's not grounded in a in a in God becoming like us in every respect. In actual fact, it ultimately doesn't exist at the at the realm of actuality. It's always just an idea. So what what we have is the backing, the 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 actual fact behind the idea to ground what this what these things actually mean. So that it's not subject to shifting cultural norms, but is grounded in the in who Christ is and what he actually did. Same thing with resurrection. Resurrection isn't some metaphor for enlightenment, some metaphor for um, the beyond. It's an actual fact. And as such, I actually know what my resurrection will be like. I don't know all the details, but I in the, through the text and through the witness of the apostles, I get to see what resurrection actually entails. And it entails a glorified body and uh, participation with Christ in the Father. Like These are the things that I have a hope for. Mm-hmm. And so it's not ephemeral and metaphorical. It's, mm-hmm. it's real and substantive. I don't, yeah. know what, I don't know what we will be. I don't know how glorious that we would just got a glimpse through through Jesus Christ, but we did get a glimpse, and that glimpse was real, and that means that my hope is correspondingly real. If I think about it, actually, as real, and and uh, what's who's the poet that says this? Um, if if his if his amino acids were not remit, remit, the church will fall. Like if I start to think about Jesus as he tells me he is when he is raised as a man of flesh and blood. I get a bigger picture of what resurrection entails than I would with just this ephemeral idea and hope. Uh, I, I get to see a realm in which life can flourish, not through decay, but ever increasingly. I, I get to see not this, these bodiless forms you know, floating in, in, in ethereal clouds, but I, I see my God who eats fish and enjoys fellowship with the disciples. And there's great, there's profound mysteries there. But what I'm, what I'm being provoked to ponder is a world that operates completely unlike the one I, I currently live in and yet is truly a genuine new creation, a new version of this world in which the Kings bring their glories into the heavenly places. So Ponder the text, I guess. Don't don't ignore the kinds of questions and don't be satisfied with simple answers. Whether those answers are come from stalwart conservative theologians or uh, liberal theologians, I think we sometimes are too content with easy answers to the text. And it short circuits our ability to ponder the the depth of and the beauty of what's actually taken place among us. Hmm. I, I, that's my that's my sort of gut response is I need to let the text have more the text of scripture have more role in my theology than probably I'm content to allow. That's good though because I think a lot of people are quick to assume that what someone says on a podcast is true, but they're not like the mm-hmm. Berean who goes back and checks what the scripture actually say and not just get uh, excited about the new fad that's out and actually think about an ancient faith. And I think we do that in dialogue with others and especially the tradition Mm -hmm. of the church. You know, we don't do that as 
you know, me and my Bible. And I, by grit, am going to figure out what the text really means, even though 2000 years have passed of, of thinking about these things, but allowing the text to be the norming norm. It's, Mm -hmm. it's an attitude of approaching the text as the thing about which I ponder and conform my thinking in dialogue with the people in my life who understand it, the historic church, the creeds and confessions, this then is is the pattern for critical thinking about how this applies to me and to my church. So Machen goes to great lengths to show the incredible power of a sinless Christ atonement for our sin and the great comfort that comes from placing your faith in Christ. He rightly points out that this is a quandary for liberals, whether Christ sinned or not. Why is this such a sticking point for liberals? I love this move that he makes. It's so fu- it's so fascinating because on the one hand, you've got this liberal ideology of putting forth Jesus as as an example. But there are these there are these spots that Machen picks. Like actually, you know, if he if if Christ is sinful, then he's not unique. He, he he's not the full flowering of humanity. There is in principle someone who could do it better. Uh, if, if he's not ontologically or redemptive historically different than the rest of all humanity, then in some ways we're still waiting for mm-hmm. the perfect flower of, of human expression and human obedience or whatever that might be. Um, on the other hand, the, it's the particular spots that Machen picks where we are encouraged by Jesus himself to not follow his example. Like, for example, um, Jesus does not confess his own sins. Uh, so if I'm following actually the example of Jesus, uh, the, the righteous man, the only man who can say to the Father, judge me in accordance with my righteousness, uh, I, I cannot follow him in that. Hmm. I cannot pray that prayer in the same way that he prays it. So if Christ was a truly sinless supernatural savior, what does that mean for his followers? What does this God who has blessed us expect from us? So P- Peter, I think, learned that lesson. I mean, he, he, he learned the lesson of Jesus is alone, the truly holy one. And then because he is holy, I am to be holy. That's 1 Peter 1, you know, that you have been called... To, by a holy God as his children. You are no longer children of the world. You are no longer children of wrath. You are children of the holy God. So be holy as he is holy. And that, from a reform perspective, is the proper movement. The imperative, to, to use the kind of classic framing of it, the imperative is uh, grounded in the indicative. And without the indicative, there is no there is no imperative. And you mean by uh, indicative, that, the the statement or the receiving Christ's gift versus a command? Right. So the indicative is that is God's work mm-hmm. in space and time, that his historical work to establish covenant with humanity. So I would ground it. I could ground that indicative. I could talk about the indicative in terms of creation. There's a creational indicative. He made us and made us to be sons of God. Adam was his first son mm-hmm. that he made to rule the earth and, and, and cultivate it. And then from that indicative, from what God has done, done with and for Adam and Eve, comes the imperative, be fruitful and multiply and cultivate the garden and extend, you know, all of this kind of stuff. In the same way, now in the state of redemption, it is precisely because I have been ransomed from my the, my wicked forefathers, I love you, Dad. The wick my wicked forefathers, and been placed into uh, and, and now call Christ or now call God my Father. Mm-hmm. That I am therefore called to be holy as He is holy. Mm-hmm. And then similarly, later in First Peter four, uh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. This is the path of sanctification in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution. You are to arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. What way of thinking is that? That which Jesus uh, had when he descended and when he rose. So, So I'm to approach suffering 
in all of its forms, but especially persecution, as sharing in Christ's suffering so that I might also share in his glory. Mm-hmm. So the again, the indicative is grounding the imperative. It's because of the way in which Christ did it that I am then called to go and, and be likewise. One of the most indicative signs of a liberal theology is a critical interpretation of miracles. If, according to the liberals, miracles are simply inessential, why does Machen insist that they are a fundamental part of confessional orthodoxy? For so many people, miracles, like Jesus walking on water or raising the dead, can be an obstacle to faith. Many liberal theologians claim to have made these miracles more cohabitable with a rational view of the world. But how does a liberal explain miracles? And how does this differ from an explicitly Christian definition? I mean, there's a lot of different ways that, or different kinds of explanations offered for the miracles. There's kind of the classic, uh, you know, rationalization in some way of, you know, treating the miracle as the, as a uncommon but nevertheless natural event. Um, the God didn't part the Red Sea. It was tied. We, we've studied the tides and, you know, it, he the Israel was able to go through a special time of, of, of a low tide or something like that. Um, Jesus was not casting out demons. This is psychological problems and Jesus brings peace and comfort in the midst of those kinds of things. And we see this kind of healing occur. So there's that kind of approach. There's um, the mythologization approach that uh, what we have is the life and times of Jesus read through a kind of Hellenistic mythological lens. And so we get from that kind of a chosen one idea and all of these kinds. So there's a lot of different approaches, I think, to, getting around the miracles, uh, the presupposition behind all of those explanations is essentially that miracles can't happen. And miracles can't happen because God cannot intrude into space and time. Mm -hmm. And at this point, Machen goes into, you know, pantheism on the one hand and deism on the other, these two Mm -hmm. poles, these two philosophical poles for thinking about metaphysics. Uh, are both a denial of the absolute God acting in space and time in this kind of relative framework. Deism, the absolute denial of the intrusion. Pantheism, the denial of God's absoluteness. So hmm. we've got, that fits very well with the Greek Greco-Roman philosophy and theology as well. So this is, you know, this is an age, this is a tale as old as time, as it were, hmm. uh, that there's this, inability for us to think that God as an absolute being would be involved in the day-to-day existence, my day and day, day in, day out existence. Uh, and it's at that point that we can locate the truly unique thing about Christianity, which is that we have this transcendent God, this God who is above all things, who is unlike us in every respect, who nevertheless speaks to us in a way that we can understand, loves us as a, a, a mother loves her children, you know, that that gets down and talks to us and watches us and looks out for us, and then in the end saves us. So there's this fundamental difference between not just in terms of like belief in individual miracles and whether or not they happened or could happen, but metaphysical ground of how the universe works. Hmm. And Machen's claim is that our universe is one in which our God lovingly creates and sustains and upholds the world by the word of his power. You know, at one point, Machen says, without the miracles, we should have a teacher. With the miracles, we have a savior. Mm -hmm. And from Thomas Jefferson to Machen's day and to ours, people are skeptical of miracles, obviously. Why are they so absolutely essential? to the Christian faith. I think it's grounded in, in, in that idea of God with us, that God isn't just providing us a path to himself, but is provide is giving to us himself. 
hmm. uh, that that God is not just showing us how to live a successful life, but is saving us from a a world that is fallen and broken and ultimately doomed to die. Hmm. So the the miracles, yeah, the miracles do more than they're they're more than just sort of flash and bang witnesses that Jesus is doing what he says he's doing. They're, they're not, they do function as testimony. Um, wow. How powerful this man must be, you know, but they, they also tell us about the kind of work that Jesus is doing. It, they actually image for us the kind of God we worship. We worship a God who would delight in overwhelming us with fish with, with blessing my kids don't like fish, so that wouldn't work for them. But, <laughs> but Peter likes fish, and so he he overwhelms him with fish. We worship a God who is holy, as we are holy, and so we see doom and on the on the mountaintop and in the seat of judgment. You know, so these are these images are non arbitrary. They're not just supposed to be really cool, so that we believe what Jesus has said. They're actually testimonies of his of the kind of work that he is Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. and the kind of God that we worship. Yeah. Machen's chapter follows a fascinating trajectory from affirming Jesus as a supernatural person to insisting on the power of sin and Christ's ultimate victory over sin to the essential affirmation of the historicity of miracles. And based on all of that, it becomes inevitable that we have to proclaim Jesus is God. But Machen insists that it's important to state what we mean by that. So what do we actually mean by that? Well, uh, we mean the full truth of Trinitarian orthodoxy and a Chalcedonian definition of the two uh, natures and single person of Christ. So we're in deep mysteries now, and I'm just a lowly New Testament scholar, David. I don't know if I'm qualified to talk about these things. No, you are. The creeds uh, and confessions, <laughs> as you say. We just the, go back to the creeds and the confessions of the faith. That's right. Well, and I mean, I would go back to Hebrews 1 yes, uh, to definitely. kind of ground this discussion, because there's this really fun thing that the author of Hebrews does. You know, he says, he, he starts out with what the liberal, with, with this idea that liberalism does not like high Christology, that the idea that Jesus is a divine person, and he doesn't become a divine person. He's always been a divine person. And it's very clear, you know, he shares in the divine nature. He is the exact imprint of his substance. He's, uh, he upholds the world by the word of his power and all things were created through him. And that's what the author of Hebrews means by son. Jesus is son because he is eternal son. And that's where we start talking about our Trinitarian, Nicene, good old, Creedal theology there. He is eternal son, pre-existent son, begotten, not made. And it's all there in, you know, in these, these high Christology texts. Mm-hmm. But the really fun thing is that, uh, that in the very next verse, we are told that after making purification of sin, so then we're now in space and time, right? We're not before the foundations of the world. We're in space and time. After making purifications of sins, we can date that he be, he received a name. He received a name. He was given a name by the Father, a name that he didn't have before, and that name is Son. Hmm. Uh, well, so how can he how can he receive a name Son? I thought he was Son from all time. Mm-hmm. Well, the solu- Hebrew solution to that problem is that Son is both a divine term and an Adamic term. Jesus is Son. In two respects, he is son because he is eternally begotten, not made. Uh, He and and eternal divine person, son, logos, you know, there's various words for that scripturally. But he's also son because he, like Adam, is given rule over the created order. He's Messiah son, king son, Mm -hmm. Adamic son, uh, Luke's genealogy. Adam is the son of God, 
and and Jesus is the true son of God in that sense. So he takes up that idamic role. And I think that's um, that's the point at which Christianity and liberalism diverge because son from a liberal perspective can only apply to his humanity. And that, and so he's, he's example. He's uh, he's, he's like us in every respect. He gives us the path of faith, but it is not in the end, God visiting his people. Hmm. Uh, and the logic of Hebrews is the logic of Luke logic of Paul that salvation is precisely God visiting his many sons as the divine son. And because it's that kind of visitation, he is able then to take the many sons to glory, Hebrews 2. Mm -hmm. So it's Hebrews describes all of this as fitting. And I like that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just this beautiful, perfect story that just fits together. Yeah. And it fits because God, because Jesus is a human, uh, uh, has a human nature, and lives an authentic human life, and is has a divine nature, and comes to us as a divine person. Yeah, the modern liberal though says Machen basically affirms that Jesus is God, and not because they think high of Jesus, but because they think desperately low of God. <laughs> Which is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think there's a lot of things going on there from kind of a liberal perspective. There's this allergy to thinking about a, a God who will judge, a God who is king. Um, so the 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 watchword of kind of liberalism is the fa is G the God as a father, a loving father, a father figure, and then we are his many children. Uh, all of that is, of course, biblical. Um, we're not denying the fatherhood of God or the brotherhood of of mankind, but it's not the only picture and image that we have of God. And so, we also have God as Lord and King, God as Judge of all the earth, God as Holy and Holy Other. I say, you know, we've get all of these different descriptions of God <clears throat> and. What Christianity does is hold all of them together, hmm. and in a in a beautiful harmony. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do. I, mm -hmm. How do I think about God as a loving Father and God as a eternal King and Judge? Uh, those don't mesh with my experience of fathers and kings, and so it's hard for me to do that. And what liberalism does is say, well, you just you can't. Some of those ideas are more primitive than the others. We've got to get rid of this idea that God is an apocalyptic judge. We got to get rid of, and so we, and when we get rid of that. We get rid of penal substitutionary atonement. We get rid yeah, of, of course the need for justification and imputation. We get rid of yeah. all of that just goes be, you know, alongside of it gets weeded out with this idea that God cannot be a retributive God mm -hmm. because God is father. Mm -hmm. So I think, what Machen is pointing out is that in order to, for the, for the liberal, in order to maintain the love of God, they've got to lower God's standards. Mm -hmm. the, and by contrast, the true Christian approach is, no, we have all of these things all at once, and God is one and undivided and is, in fact, love. But that's not uh, contradictory to his anger at sin, but rather the, the, the cause of it. He, he is love, so he lovingly punishes that which is not loving. That's right. uh, so, so for Machen, it's hard, but it all holds together. Yeah. And for various heterodox kinds of approaches to Christianity, well, we've got to carve these things off of our definition of God mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't, we can't figure out how they how they work. It's clear that the liberals' low view of God is devastating for the Christian faith. But what can we do about it? I think liberalism as a kind of defined and academic movement, which is what Machen is mostly dealing with, has it's still there, but not as a defined and academic movement. Uh, a lot of the tenets 
of li liberalism are still in the air, but the more sophisticated exegetical and historical work that grounded it isn't, you know, no, it's, it's hard to maintain the idea that the new Testament doesn't teach that Jesus is God hmm. um, or that that is a part of the first Christian uh, set of, of creeds and beliefs. Um, Ma Ma Machen points that out, the, the silliness of trying to maintain that Paul invented the idea that Jesus is God. Hmm. So, you know, you've got scholars who have pretty much put to rest some of those historical claims. And so uh, this idea, I think that God, for example, is not a retributive God or that we should get rid of penal substitutionary atonement or we should get rid of uh, pre-existence of Christ. It It's detached itself from the attempt to say, this is what the Bible teaches. Uh and that that's a little bit more subtle. You've got a that that idea is still alive and well, um, but it's a bit more subtle now because it operates. I think it operates primarily by watering down theology. Hmm. Um, we don't need dogma. We don't need these kinds of really tight conceptual ideas like justification and imputation and sanctification these kind of creedal, um, uh, this kind of creedal, deep theological nuance. We just need to love. We just need to do what Jesus did. And, and so that that's a little bit more subtle because it lacks that rigorous, what I think was a rigorous academic and historical tr attempt to bring this ethic into the new Testament, it's this detached ethic into the new Testament itself. And it operates at a much more popular level now. Yeah. Um, you, you know, be who you are, love mm -hmm. the, these, these kinds of, of ethical movements. Mm -hmm. And for Machen, when you lose that theological depth, when you lose the, the Chalcedonian definition of the two natures of Christ, when you lose the uh, Trinitarian view of God's redemptive historical work in space and time, you lose actually the ground of ethical reasoning for a Christian. So maybe that's a long way of saying liberalism, I think, a, a, is alive and well through a kind of anti-theological, anti-intellectual movement in the church. Hmm. And it results, it's going to result in sloppy thinking about what redemption is and ultimately sloppy thinking about what the, the good life is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there, it just seems like what you said, Machen and the New Testament holds all these things together. God is judge and yet one who's willing to love the world by giving his only son right. uh, or Jesus Christ as Lord and also friend. Yeah, uh, yeah, but we right. tend to kind of amplify one aspect over another because of our own sinful desires and what we want to hear scripture say, as opposed to what it just clearly lays out and what others in the church have confirmed. So it seems that we construct a, a Christ of our own, and that seems mm -hmm. to be the, the perennial human problem. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. At the end of this chapter on Christ, Machen concludes with a stunning description of the reality of Jesus Christ. I asked Tommy about this and why it matters so much that we worship a real Jesus. Here's a clip from the audiobook. The liberal Jesus, despite all efforts of modern psychological reconstruction to galvanize him into life, remains a manufactured figure of the stage. Very different is the Jesus of the New Testament and of the great scriptural creeds, that Jesus is indeed mysterious. Who can fathom the mystery of his person? But the mystery is a mystery in which a man can rest. The Jesus of the New Testament has at least one advantage over the Jesus of modern reconstruction. He is real. He is not a manufactured figure suitable as a point of support for ethical maxims, but a genuine person whom a man can love Men have loved him, 
through all the Christian centuries. And the strange thing is that despite all the efforts to remove him from the pages of history, there are those who love him still. Yeah, that language of real is actually very rich. It's a simple word, right? But there's there's a richness and depth to it. It, He's real in the sense that all of this is true. Like this actually happened. And he actually dwells with the Father now in eternal glory. And he actually intercedes for us uh, from the heavenly tabernacle in our own wilderness wandering. Like all of that is actually real in the sense of true. Um, but the the other way in which it's real, and I think this is what the burden of Machen's book is try, is trying to say, the other reason that it's real is is Christianity is actually about this relationship. Mm-hmm. It is it is not a religion of ideas. It's it's I just said how important doctrine is, but Christianity isn't a set of doctrines. It's not, in the end, this network of propositional truth. Uh, though it is true, and though it has propositional truth attached to it, Christianity is ultimately real because it is grounded in a, a relationship between God and creation. Because God is real, because Jesus is real, and because they're persons, and they have a genuine relationship with with what they have made and what they have saved. And, and that's the hope of the Christian faith. It's a hope that we, the, the beatific vision, it's the hope that we will dwell with him. Mm-hmm. And that is more real than, uh, than any of the attempt, man-made attempts at religion that we can develop. Yeah. And I think like we talked about earlier, coming around full circle, books like these where anti-intellectualism is combated with an intellectual approach to scripture, but an intellectual approach that is not devoid of love for the real person. Mm -hmm. I think that's just what Augustine says when he says someone who thinks he understands the scriptures but cannot build up double love for God and neighbor is actually ignorant. He has not yet understood the scriptures. And so it seems that Machen ending on this note is just trying to affirm that sort of lovingly dogmatic approach to defending the faith and also helping the church understand who the real Jesus is. Beautiful. Man, well, I've tremendously enjoyed our conversation, Tommy. Thank you so much. It's been spiritually encouraging to think about the person of Jesus, miracles, sin, and God himself as he's manifested himself in Jesus Christ. And so thank you very much for this conversation. Oh, this was a joy. We should have, we should have done this a long time ago. Many thanks to my guest, Dr. Thomas Keene. Join me next time for my conversation with Peter Loback about Machen's legacy at the seminary he founded. Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. This episode of Christianity and Liberalism was brought to you by Westminster Seminary Press. Westminster Seminary Press has published a brand new edition of the book this show is based on, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen. This 100th anniversary edition features a new forward by Kevin DeYoung and is available to order now at wtsbooks.com. Listeners to this podcast can get a free download of the Christianity and Liberalism audiobook at checkout when you enter the promo code MACHEN23. That's M-A-C-H-E-N 23. This podcast was based on the book Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen and hosted by David Brionis. This episode was produced by Josh Curry and Jimmy Atkins. Audio captured by Paul Quorum edited and engineered by Will Bowblitz. Our theme song was written by Timothy Brindle and produced by Nobody Special. Thanks for listening.
nature wrote Christianity and liberalism to demonstrate the two completely different religions. Liberalism denies man's wicked condition and divine inspiration with which scripture was written. Us Christians are convinced scripture's truly factual, but liberalism denies the supernatural. Matron's book definitely showed Christianity and liberalism are diametrically opposed. It's not a different version of Christianity, it has opposite views of God and humanity. Often disguised with Christian terminology, they baptize the serpents of certain philosophy. So when we call you a liberal, it's not just political, but rejecting his virgin birth and all of his miracles from trusting in science. But against God, it's disgusting to find itself is your trust and reliance. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is God and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. We bring the antithesis, the lamb's dripping wrists is still the only answer for man's wickedness. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is God and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. CNL with Machen, we will tell. Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell. Machen press men, to be honest. Don't call it Christian if it essentially is godless. Christianity is based on events God accomplished. Christ was sent to bring redemption, he promised. Yeah. Not just an ethical leader, respectable teacher, but God in the flesh. Yes, our blessed redeemer, an affront to human pride. You can only be saved by faith in Christ who was crucified. Amen. Our greatest needs to be redeemed by the Son. It's not what we're Jesus do but what Jesus has done since we're slaves that doubt pride and lust we're in desperate need of rescue that's outside of us an understatement to say that we're flawed in need of what nature called a creative act of God because we're torn by sin we've been abhorring him not just sick but dead we must be born again God's enemies his arrogant opponents who can only be saved by vicarious atonement judgment fell on Christ in my place unrighteous guilty sinners are only righteous by grace scriptures historical acts they are certain Jesus the God man the supernatural person we need new hearts he's the compassionate surgeon by his death and resurrection he's smashing the serpent the line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man upon the rock of the word of God we will stand we bring the antithesis the lamb's dripping wrists is still the only answer for man's wickedness the line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL with Machen we will tell faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from my hell. intention is to show when I'll mention in this flow Machen's words are as useful as a century ago uh -huh. liberalism breeds destruction it's hopeless today it's deconstruction and wokeness rooted in paganism atheism like Satan's mission to make CRT state religion these abominations we see to this day in denominations like the PC USA why embrace Machen's great wisdom in light of the claims of his racism in 1913 Machen wrote mom complaining Angry about Princeton's campus integration I can't believe the decision of Warfield But this cancer of heart, I'm sure the Lord healed See, Warfield became Machen's mentor An instrument for Machen to repent more Showing his need of the Savior to change him But consider the Lord's grace of sanctification Machen became friends with an African-American named Charlie Machen Gladly had cherished him As a matter of fact, Charlie had a cataract Skin color didn't matter as Machen had his back Paid for the operation, stayed with him in the hospital Christ changing Machen, not an impossible obstacle Amen. From his love for his friend Charlie It's quite clear Christ was changing Machen partly Any bigotry left, it's not there any longer Perfected now in the presence of his father The line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand We bring the antithesis The lamb's dripping wrists Is still the only answer for man's wickedness The line is drawn in the sand Christ is God and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL with Machen we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell